a lot of great functions, but one of their best functions is really just keeping things out that you want out and keeping things in that you want in. But in order to do that, in order to have like compartments, in order to have cells, you need to be able to let things in that you want and out that you don't want. And so we need a way to get molecules through lipid membranes and membrane proteins are going to play an important role in this process for anything other than really simple little nonpolar or small polar molecules that can just diffuse through, they're going to need some help. And so we're going to talk about different ways in which membrane proteins can help molecules get into and out of cells. Depending on the properties of the molecules, as well as their concentrations inside and outside of the cells, and whether they're charged and whether the cell's charged, this is all going to influence how hard it is for that molecule to actually get where you want it to go. And so you might have to spend energy, in which case we would call it active transport, or you might not, in which case we would call it passive transport. And we'll talk about some of the different ways in which proteins can provide channels for the passive transport and pump molecules in the case of active transport, either directly or kind of indirectly. One of the important things to think about when it comes to membrane proteins is that the transmembrane part, so the part that actually goes through the membrane, is kind of inside out. So we talked a lot about how normally proteins kind of have their hydrophilic parts on the outside and their hydrophobic parts on the inside, away from the water. Well, this is true for the parts of membrane proteins that are exposed to the water, such as the endodomain, so the part that's like inside the cell, and the ectodomain, the parts that's outside the cell. But as for the transmembrane domain, the part that's actually going through the membrane, well, here on the outside, it has to have those kind of hydrophobic parts. And on the inside, it'll have those hydrophilic parts um, if it has like a channel or something like this. If it doesn't have a channel, then you'll basically just see that all of it's going to be hydrophobic in the middle. As to how they're getting through the membrane, as to how the protein gets through the membrane, you can have the multiple passes. So basically each time it travels like from one side of the membrane to another, we call that a pass. And these passes are typically gonna be as alpha helices or beta strands and sheets. And then you kind of have these spots on the other inside and outside, which can be more hydrophilic because they're exposed to the aqueous environment. But the parts on the in the lipid inside, or at least the parts facing the lipid, are going to be hydrophobic. And then kind of like you can get channels, though, where you have hydrophilic residues on, say, one side of these alpha helices that are going to provide that hydrophilic channel. So you're often going to see alpha helices. You're going to see beta strands. You also might see beta barrels. And so these beta barrels are kind of these little like rings of beta strands. And then you can get kind of channels that form from lots of these barrels. So the barrel itself isn't the pore, isn't the channel, but you get like a pore, a channel formed from a ring of these barrels. So that's kind of a couple of key ways that key stru structural features you might see in a transporter protein but you're often going to see these kind of helices or you're going to see barrels making multiple passes through the membrane. And um, with alpha helices, because things are more compact, you're gonna have more amino acids per packs as opposed to your beta strands. At the end of the day, you're able to have these hydrophobic parts on the outside, the hydrophilic parts on the inside of your pore if you have a pore, and you can have amino acids sticking out into the pore to help control the pore size as well as its selectivity. So now that we know how these membrane proteins can get through the membrane, let's talk about how they can help other things get through the membrane. Let's talk about how membrane proteins can serve as transporters um, or, or channels and pores and things like this to help molecules get through membranes. This help can be in the form of what we call active transport, where it like requires a energy such as ATP um, or the coupling to a favorable transport or it could be passive, no energy required, just a selective pore or something, or even just simple diffusion. And things like this can actually serve as providing energy for our active transport, which is what we call secondary active transport. And we'll get into all of these concepts. But first let's think about what would make it favorable or unfavorable for something to move through a membrane. Basically the molecular motivation to move comes from gradients. There are a few different types of gradients that we could talk about. We can refer to chemical gradients, in which case we have things moving from high concentration to low concentration. 
Um, and this is just happening basically via diffusion. So when diffusion, when you dissolve a solute, basically you're gonna start with where you dissolve that solute, you're gonna have a high concentration of the solute molecules. Those molecules are going to move around randomly. Um, and based on the randomness of their movement, they're going to kind of end up dispersing themselves. Um, and then this is random movement is ultimately going to lead to the net movement from high concentration to low concentration, um, where you would then ultimately end up with an even distribution. There's also electrical gradients. So you just as we've been talking about how we have all those like IMFs and things like this, everything from molecular interactions to when we're doing an electrophoretic gel. We're moving from, in the, well, in the case of the gel, we're going from negative to positive, but you can also go from positive to negative. Bottom line, opposites subtract, like charges repel, um, and this can serve as motivation to move. So we have the combination of both the chemical gradient and in the case of a charged molecule, the electrical gradient, which together give us what we call electrochemical gradients. So here is an example. I'm kind of showing what's going on inside and outside of our cells in terms of membrane potential. So this is going to be electric gradient from electric gradient. And then when we're talking about concentrations, this is referring to our chemical gradient. And you don't need to know these exact numbers, but what you can see is that basically inside of our cell compared to outside of our cell, is the sodium going to be higher inside of our cell or lower inside of our cell? Yeah, sodium is going to be lower. So we have lower sodium. And then what about our potassium? Yeah, our potassium is gonna be higher. But then outside of our cell, we're going to have the opposite. We're going to have higher sodium and lower potassium. I like to think about special K, our cells are special. Um, and so inside of our cells, we have a high, we have a high concentration of potassium. If we were to just think in terms of their chemical gradient, which way would that potassium want to go? Yeah, the potassium would want to go out and the sodium would want to go in. And if we think about in terms of our electric gradient, where would they want to go? Basically inside of our cell, what this is saying when it says a membrane potential of minus 50 to minus 70 millivolts, this is saying that inside the cell is more negative. Um, and so if inside of our cell is more negative, well then they both just based on the charge alone want to go in. So obviously we need to consider both the electric and the chemical gradients, but then we also need to think about, wait a second, we just said that if all things were being even, um, if everything could kind of move freely, there'd eventually be no gradients because you would be diffusing out to an even concentration. You would be having those positive charges go to the minus charges, neutralizing everything, making that so that that membrane didn't have any membrane potential. So clearly, if we have a situation like this, there's something going on. Our cells are actually working to keep things out of balance. And so today, that's what we're gonna talk about. So basically, instead of just letting everything through, membranes are what we call semi-permeable. Um, so by permeable, we're talking about allowing things through and semi-partially. Um, so basically, this is partially permeable. The things that can get through, we say that they are um, penetrating. Um, we can have like a penetrating solute. So in this example, basically this solute A is going to be penetrating. So the membrane is permeable to, sol to solute A, as well as to the water. Both of these can get through the membrane. However, it's impermeable with respect to solute B. So we say that solute B is going to be non-penetrating. So if something can't get through the membrane, we say it's non-penetrating. If it can get through the membrane, we say it's penetrating. 
And then if we think about things from the membrane's perspective, it would be permeable to things that are penetrating and impermeable to things that are non-penetrating. So those are just a couple of the terms that we can use to describe um, what can and can't get through a membrane. And so now let's talk about why things can and can't get through membranes. Cell membranes are only freely permeable, so through like simple diffusion, so things just moving through on their own. Only a few things can get through there, um, such as like smallish nonpolar molecules, because remember we've got that the lipids are mostly hydrophobic, even though they've got those hydrophilic heads, as well as small polar but neutral molecules. Um, so this includes water. Um, so water also has channels called aquaporins to help more go in and out, um, but water can also diffuse to some extent through that membrane. And I know it sounds a little weird because we're like, wait, lipids are hydrophobic and we're talking about how like lipids repel water and all this stuff. But it turns out that water is small enough that a little bit of it can get that some of it can just diffuse through. Um, but if we're talking about something charged, even if it's really small, that's not going through. Um, and if we're talking about something bigger, but nonpolar, um, but, but polar, such as like a sugar, maybe that's going to need help getting through as well. So in order to get those other molecules through cells, um, through the membrane, we need help with from integral membrane proteins or IMPs. Um, and cells can then use energy to move molecules in order to maintain those gradients. Like we saw in the case of our sodium and potassium ions um, and tapping them in concentrations that would, not, that would not happen if we had things just move to equilibrium where everything would end up being even. And so we're going to see how we can use energy, we can use various transporters, we can use all these different strategies in order to maintain maintain gradients and maintain what we call like potential. So basically separated gradients is going to lead to potential energy. And we could talk about chemical potential, electrical potential, and osmotic potential. Basically, if we think back to like our example of being in a roller coaster and being at the top of a roller coaster and kind of having like potential energy, you have the potential to go down the slope and release energy. Similarly, if we have, um, we can have like chemical or electrical potential, osmotic potential, basically potential energy that comes based on having a, um, being able to kind of move from a region that's less favorable to a region that's more favorable. Um, and therefore having a thermodynamically, favor thermodynamically favorable reaction that's going to be able to release energy. So there are three main types of potential, our chemical potential. So this again is just going to depend on the concentration of that specific molecule. So each molecule is going to have a chemical potential that's in terms of that molecule's concentration inside and outside of the cell or inside and outside of, of a membrane bound compartment. We also have the electrical potential. Um, so sometimes this is abbreviated BM. This is going to depend on the concentration of all of our charged molecules. So this depends on all of the ions, not just the specific one we're looking at. We can always talk about like an electrical elect, um, um, electrochemical gradient, but basically it's only going to matter if the molecule that we're moving is going to be charged. And so we'll see how we can see an equation. And if we don't have a charged molecule, then this part of the equation where we're dealing with the electrical potential will kind of just cancel out and equal zero. Um, and then, and that's going to depend on all the molecules as opposed to just your, just the one you're looking at. Another gradient, another potential that um, I just want to mention, but that's not going to be specific for our molecule moving, is actually when our molecule can't move or can't move well. And basically, instead, it's the water moving. So the osmotic potential, this deals with the movement of our solvent. So in the case of biochemistry, our solvent is going to be our water. And it's going to depend on the concentration of all the solutes, all the solutes in a mixture. Um, and this is what we refer to as one of those colligative properties. So going back to our chemistry, if there's colligative properties, things like our um, freezing point depression, those things that rely, that depend only on the concentration of the dissolved particles. So in the case of our osmotic potential, basically what we're saying is that our solute is non-penetrating. So the membrane is impermeable to it, but water can is penetrating, water can go through. 
Um, and therefore what's going to happen is that this water is going to go through and kind of like dilute out the solutes. This is not really how it's happening. Um, basically it's just that random movement of water and kind of if there's more other stuff around, the effective concentration of water is gonna be less. So it's like, like there's less water inside, um, like there's less water when there's a lot of solutes. And so then the water is gonna move from its high concentration to its low concentration. So you're gonna get this net movement from the high water concentration to the low water concentration. Um, but then this is also going to be movement from the low solute concentration to the high solute concentration. But you have to think about things in terms of water and then you can see that it's really going from our high to our low. We're not really gonna talk about osmosis here, but remember that going back to our idea about why we wouldn't want to store sugars as um, like for storage as monosaccharides, because then basically you'd have high solute concentrations that would drive a bunch of water into the cells. Um, well, that was coming because you, the cells aren't freely permeable to those solutes, but that doesn't mean that solutes don't have a way to get through cells. And so now let's talk about those ways. Basically, the way that we're going to take is going to depend on whether or not it's kind of energetically favorable to go into a cell or to go out of a cell. And when we're talking about energetic favorability, when we're talking about our thermodynamic favorability, we need to think back to our good old delta G. And so remember that a negative delta G is going to be thermodynamically favorable. This is going to say that our end state, um, so if our molecule is in the new place, it's going to be happier than if it was in the old place. Um, and whereas a positive delta G, this is going to be unfavorable. Um, basically, we're saying that we're taking some thing from where it likes to be to somewhere it likes to be less. And so how do we know where it likes to be more or less? There's actually an equation that directly relates the delta G, so the free energy change in transporting a molecule along its chemical gradient, so the C's and the electrical gradient, which is gonna be this part of the equation, giving us the electrochemical gradients. And the delta G, so whether or not it's actually favorable for the molecule to go in that direction, will depend on the combination of both the chemical gradient and the electrochemical gradient and the electric gradient. So basically the chemical potential, the electric potential. If your molecule is not charged, then this part of the equation, so Z is the charge on the molecule. If your molecule is not charged, this part's just gonna be zero. And so we can use this equation for the electrochemical gradient for just the chemical gradient or an electrochemical gradient. If we have a negative delta G, if things are favorable, our movement is going to be exergonic. So it's gonna produce energy and therefore it can move via what we call passive transport. So it doesn't need energy in order to get it to move. Instead, we're gonna get energy if it moves naturally. Conversely, if we have something with a positive delta G, therefore there the movement is going to be endergonic, it's going to require energy. And therefore, it to, in order to get it to move, we're gonna to have to put in some work, we're gonna to have to use active transport. So here it moves kind of because it wants to, and here it moves because we're kind of forcing it to. So there's going to be different ways that we can kind of get, allow things through a membrane. These are going to be broken up into active transport and passive transport. So basically, this side of things is going to be passive, and this is going to be active. If we're talking about passive transport, this is going to be along its gradient. It's going to be in the favorable direction with regards to its potential. We don't need to put in energy, but if it's against the gradient, it's against that potential, then we need to use active transport. We're gonna actually have to put in energy. And so now let's look at different ways in which we can do this. First in the overview, and then we'll go into some specific examples. So with passive transport, remember that this is again this is along our gradient. So this is going to be in the exergonic um, direction. Um, so it's going to be energetically favorable. We mentioned how there were a few things that could kind of freely diffuse. Um, so nonpolar molecules and really small polar ones. And they're going to be able to diffuse simply based on their electrochemical gradient. So it's gonna be our electrochemical gradient, but really it's just gonna be our chemical gradient. And why? Well, because we can't get ions to diffuse freely. Just can't diffuse freely. 
through the membrane. So in our equation, basically that Z is gonna be zero. And so that part's gonna cancel out. But I like to kind of just think about things in terms of the electrochemical gradient to use that same equation um, and just have that part not, not matter. Okay, so but we can have our nonpolar molecules and our really small polar molecules just diffuse through. Some things are going to need help to get through. And so like our ions, those um, that we were saying couldn't just diffuse through, but still they can have a favorable, they can have a favorable inside versus outside. Um, they can have a favorable drive to get in. They just have a barrier to actually getting through that membrane. If we can provide them a channel, if we can provide them a route through that membrane, that's going to give them some hydrophilic stuff that's going to uh, make their transport easier, then we can allow them to diffuse along their gradient and so still be energetically favorable. And so we can do this through like selective channels. If, however, we want to move things in the direction that is unfavorable thermodynamically, well, here we're going to have to put in some energy. There are two main forms to do this. We can call these primary active transport and secondary active transport. Again, we're going to get into examples of each of these in a little more of the details. But with primary active transport, here you're directly coupling the movements to an energy producing chemical reaction. So this is going to be like hydrolysis of ATP. Um, it could be like you get you actually phosphorylate the transporter itself and this causes a conformational change um, or you kind of just um, burn the ATP and this will cause a, a conformational change without actually phosphorylating the protein itself. But this is somehow going to couple that movement um, directly to that inner to, to to that energy producing chemical reaction. Whereas with secondary active transport, here, basically, we're using energy to transport one molecule. And then, since we then make a favorable gradient of that one molecule, now we're able to use that drive from the, the energy that's released when that favorable, that molecule goes along its gradient to drive something against its gradient. So here, basically, we were switch, swapping one molecule for another. One is going to be in, again in the favorable direction, and this is going to power the movement of the other in the unfavorable direction. Which gets me to the point that basically not all, some of the proteins are going to let through multiple substrates, and some of them are only going to let through a single substrate. Uniports, these are going to be single. So uniport transporter is going to be a single substrate. And then if we talk about um, multiple, then we can talk about, we call this co-transport. And this can be symport in which they're going in the same direction. Um, so in this example, they're both going in, or it can be antiport in which they go in opposite direction. So one goes in and one goes out. And it doesn't just have to be one-to-one. -one. So we'll see key examples, like one of the ways in which we're able to maintain that gradient in which we have um, sodium lower outside, sodium higher outside of our cells and potassium higher inside of our cells. We'll look later at how one of the key ways that we actually maintain this gradient is through this sodium potassium ADPase. This is an example of an antiporter. So it's letting one thing out and letting another thing in. Well, actually in this case, it's letting three sodiums out and letting two potassiums in. In this way, we're able to kind of pump out the sodium, pump in the potassium, maintain the potassium concentrations higher inside of the cells and those sodium concentrations higher outside of the cells, providing that chemical gradient that would have disappeared if you just let things go freely through. And we'll see that basically we're going to use energy from ATP in order to do this. Because we're having to move things against the gradient in order to maintain the gradient. And we're also going to have to, in the case of the sodium, be moving something positively charged from a negatively charged environment to a positively charged environment, which is against its electrical gradient. But first, before we get to the active transport, let's go back to our passive transport. So our simple diffusion, remember here, we don't have any channel required because the molecules are freely permeable. So this can be like really small um, polar molecules, like our water, um, or it can be nonpolar molecules, but not our charged molecules. For charged molecules, for things that are bigger, things that are more polar, 
basically we're going to need facilitated diffusion, which is going to use selective channels to make the journey through the membrane easier. So the reason why most things can't just freely diffuse through the membrane is because they're facing a high barrier to actually doing so. Now, when we're talking about these, like, these channels and these transporters, we're not really talking about enzymes that we can still consider kind of like an energy of activation, um, this delta G double dagger. And so that's what's shown in this figure. Basically, it's going to have a high energetic cost in order to get through this membrane in the absence of a transporter. And why this is, is basically we have to think about, okay, we have this molecule outside and it's going to be surrounded by water, so it's hydrated. Now we have to say, okay, give up your give up your interactions with the water and now make interactions with this hydrophobic lipid. Um, and the molecule is like, um, dude, no way. Like I'm a hydrophilic molecule. I was happy out here in the cytoplasm. I'm all polar, hanging out with the water. I'm not gonna give up my bonds to the water in order to form interactions with these lipids, which aren't gonna offer me much. And so you have to strip the water off and then go through this membrane that you don't really like. And then you can get back and you can get your water again. But going through that lippity stuff, that's going to be a huge barrier. And so what's going to happen is basically, if you have a protein that provides a channel that's going to offer alternative bonds, it's going to offer things to kind of make up for the bonds that you lost to the water, it's going to provide a more hydrophilic passage this is going to lower that activation energy for the transport and allow your molecule to get through. These, these channels can be highly selective because you can imagine you don't want just want huge pores in your membrane that let everything through or else that wouldn't be very helpful. So instead, these channels are highly selective. They have different strategies that they can use to be selective. Um, this is an example of a potassium channel. So we have a lot of different channels and pumps and things like this for dealing with potassium and sodium. And this is just one example. And in this example, what you can see is basically that when the, when the potassium is outside, it's going to be hydrated. So it's going to be connected to these water molecules. Now, as it goes in, it's kind of going to replace the bonds from to the water molecules um, with bonds to the backbone carbonyl oxygens in this channel. And this is going to help it get through the membrane um, with still favorable reactions. And then once it gets out, it can kind of um, rehydrate. Somewhat interestingly is that sodium is smaller than potassium, but sodium can't get through this channel because sodium, when it's hydrated, it's going to be too big. Um, and when it's not hydrated, then basically it's, not, it's too small to form these favorable interactions. And so this channel is going to be selective for potassium, even though you would think like sodium should be able to get through. So cells can be really clever. P proteins are awesome. Often passage through these channels is gonna be regulated. So instead of just having a channel that's open all the time and therefore would allow things to kind of diffuse to reach their um, equilibrium, which remember would kind of not would deflate all of our potentials and make it so that things wouldn't have any drive to get through. Instead, we can regulate the passage through channels. There are a couple of ways that this can be done. Some of these are kind of like have a single gate. So they're basically closed on one side and then you can open that one side. Um, some of them are kind of gonna be more like pumps um, and they're gonna have like alternating gates where one gate will open to one side and then you have something happen that causes the that gate to close and the gate to the other side to open. Um, so different strategies for regulating passage in and out. An example of a single gate is going to be like a gated ion channel. These are going to allow for rapid flux of inorganic ions in response to a stimulus. So basically the stimulus can be something like the binding of a ligand, which we call a ligand gated ion channel or a change in voltage. So a voltage gated ion channel. So both of those stimuluses, um, well, I mean, like different, there will be different ones. Of, some will respond to the ligand and some will respond to the charge. But these are going to both be ways in which you can kind of open up the gate and allow these molecules to get through quickly. Here is an example of a ligand gated channel. Um, this is going to be a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Um, and it's going to be permeable to both sodium and potassium. 
What you can see here is basically it has these multiple subunits, like a lot of membrane proteins, like a lot of transporter proteins. Um, up here, you have the acetylcholine binding site, so that's going to be our ligand. When that binds, what's going to happen is that basically the, um, the channel is going to open. So initially, this channel is kind of closed, and you can have things like come in, but they can't get through. It's going to be open to the outside. Things can come in, but they can't get through to the inside. Then what's going to happen is that the acetylcholine is going to bind. This is going to change the shape. It's going to open that gate, open that channel, allow these ions to flow through. And this is going to help your nerves um, communicate. Another way that we see nerves communicating and things like this is with charge. So we have voltage-gated ion channels. Here, a change in voltage is going to cause conformational changes that open that pore. Um, and so how could you get a protein to respond to a charge? Well, we have to think about, well, proteins can have charges too. Um, so at the termini of proteins, as well as in I mean, with amino acids that are either basic or acidic, basically they're going to respond to charge. So positively charged things are going to get um, attracted to a negative charge and they're going to get repelled from a positive charge and vice versa for our negative charges. And therefore, we can have these proteins undergo conformational changes in response to an electrical stimulus um, like our nerves send out. And so this is an example of a potassium um, channel that's going to be opened in response to voltage. So with it, in the closed form, you can see that there's not really space for this potassium. But in the open form, once it's gotten that electrical stimulus, now you have space for that potassium ion to go through. And as we'll look at shortly, ion channels are actually one of the main ways in which your cells are able to transduce information. So basically take signals from outside the cell and get those signals inside the cell in order to regulate processes. Those were the examples, though, where we're going along the gradient. We are going in the favorable direction potential wise. But now let's talk about when we have this unhappy situation where we actually have, are trying to take something from where it's happy to somewhere where it's less happy. We're pushing our ball up the hill. We need some energy to do so. And there are a couple of ways we can do this, which is primary active transport or secondary active transport. There are different types of active transporters. And so sometimes we call like primary active transporters pumps. What these have in common is that they're actually going to directly use energy, such as from ATP, like burning ATP, in order to make some change in the receptor directly that is going to open the channel or somehow allow molecules to get through. Because you're directly spending energy, though, this allows you to kind of put move these molecules against the gradient. And with a primary active transport, the transporter itself is actually going to be kind of directly spending the energy. We'll talk a lot more about ATP, but we kind of think of it as storing energy. It's not a great example because as I'll tell you, like breaking the bond is actually going to require energy, but you get more out of it. And because you get more out of the products than you have of the reactants, you get a negative delta G that we can then use to offset the cost of doing other things like causing a conformational change in our pump. The way I like to kind of think about things is that ATP, you have those phosphate groups, negatively charged, kind of holding holding them together is kind of uncomfy. Those negative charges are pelling. You break one off, you get less negative charge. You also get resonance stabilization of those phosphate groups. You get hydration, you get all of these great things. So you have to remember, you have to take in not just ATP and that bond itself, which you breaking it is going to be undergone, it's going to take energy, but then you get all these favorable interactions, you get resonance, you get all this great stuff that comes from the hydrolysis of ATP, not the breaking of the ATP, that not the breaking of the bond, but the hydrolysis reaction. And this reaction, the energy that you get from it, that negative delta G, can be used to do cool stuff like cause a receptor to change shape, um, cause a pump to change shape, and allow a molecule to move through a membrane. We won't go too much into detail about the types of primary active transporters. We'll go through a few examples, but the key types are ABC transporters, P-type ATPases, and B and F-type ATPases. Don't get tied up on the details. The important thing is that these active transporters are directly spending energy, often in the form of kind of burning ATP, and they can transport a variety of compounds.
the ABC transporters are going to, you often a lot of these are like drug transporters. So you might hear of them, something like that, like bacteria have these ABP transporters that are kind of pumping out drugs and causing problems with of antibiotic resistance. There are also P-type ATPases. Now here, the phosphate, it doesn't just get like the ATP, it doesn't just get hydrolyzed, but the receptor itself actually gets phosphorylated. And then V and F-type ATPases, these transport protons, and you don't really need to worry, not really going to worry about those. But the ATP, ABC transporters, these are the ones that are actually going to kind of just hydrolyze ATP, and that's going to cause a conformational change to open a channel to allow things through. The P-type ATPases, this is where we're phosphorylating the receptor, and that's causing a change in the receptor that'll allow things through. One of the main ones that we'll talk about in biochemistry is going to be the sodium potassium ATPase, which is an antiporter for sodium and potassium ions. So it's going to basically transport from the cytoplasm to the extracellular space. It's going to pump out um, three sodium and take in three potassium. This is going to allow us to maintain this gradient in our membranes that is very important for life as we know it. And the only reason we were able to do that was because we we're continuously pumping out more of the sodium than we were pumping in potassium, therefore keeping this negative electric potential. So our membrane potential is going to be negative, about negative 50 to negative 70. But if you talk about like neurons and stuff, well, now you can manipulate the potential in order to send signals. There are another common ATPase is like a calcium pump. So those were examples of primary active transport where we're directly coupling the use of an energy generating reaction, typically the use of ATP as we saw, either directly by phosphorylating the protein or kind of um, just by hydrolyzing the ATP itself. And this was going to allow us to provide the energy to get the molecule to move against its gradient or molecules. So remember, we could have co-transport, in which case we're transporting multiple molecules, or we could have um, uniport where we're transporting just a single one. Finally, let's talk about secondary active transport. Here, we're going to couple the movement of a molecule against this gradient, so requiring E, pushing that ball up the hill to the movement of another molecule along its gradient, so producing energy. So if we think back to our kind of roller coaster, the energy that you get going down one going down one hill is going to get you up the next hill. That's the idea that we have with our secondary active transport. So somewhere along the line, we're going to have to put in that energy to get that first thing up the hill. But then we'll use the movement of that first thing down its hill to, try to cause the movement of the other thing up its hill. So we're not really going to talk about um, that many examples of this in particular, but this is going to be one example, the sodium glucose symporter. So what does it mean by a symporter? Right, they're going to be traveling in the same direction. So what's going to happen is basically you'll have this transporter that's going to allow sodium and glucose to come through at the same time. Um, you're going to be going along the gradient for sodium. So remember that sodium is going to have a higher concentration outside than inside, and so it's going to be happy to come inside. What's going to happen is that the sodium is then going to drive, um, come inside the cell, and then this is going to be coupled to the movement of glucose, which is going to be energetically unfavored. Um, and so you, because you have this high extracellular sodium, this is going to drive the, in, the movement of glucose into the cell. These secondary transporters will typically what they'll have is basically they'll have some they'll have sites so that and they'll be regulated in a way that they're only going to open when both of those things are bound so that you don't have it. Um, you're not wasting the movement of the sodium without actually having glucose there to go through. And then remember that the reason why we have this sodium have the high concentration outside is because we're actively pumping it outside, such as with our sodium potassium ATPase um, that we're using to maintain that gradient that we can use to drive the movement of glucose into the cell. So a lot of different things. Just remember that basically if things are moving against the gradients, we're going to have to put in some energy to do so. This can be primary where we're directly using ATP or a similar molecule. We're coupling directly to a energy generating reaction to change the shape of a channel and let things in or out. 
or it could be secondary transport where we're coupling the movement of one thing along its gradient to the movement of another thing against its gradient. Sometimes, however, we don't need to put in energy to get things to move because they already have potential. Um, so that electrochemical potential that comes just from having differences in their concentrations inside or outside um, and or differences in the charge inside or outside that can then provide them the energy that they need in order to move through the membrane. However, there's actually too, not enough energy for them to move through the membrane if it weren't for having, for most of these, if it weren't for having specific channels in which to do so. Because moving through that membrane is going to require swapping out all those bonds to water for bonds for like passage through a lipid that is not gonna offer favorable things to a hydrophilic molecule. Instead, what's going to happen is basically these channel proteins are going to provide a hydrophilic route through. They're going to provide interactions that replace the interactions that are lost to water and allow these molecules through. By having the molecules like not be able to freely diffuse, but to only be able to go through certain channels, you're able to regulate what goes in and out. These channels can be highly selective and they can also be regulated by things like ligand binding or things like voltage. In these ways, the cells can make allow things to go energetically favorable directions only kind of on demand when you want them to. And then there are those few thing, those few rare things that can kind of diffuse through those nonpolar things, those really small polar molecules like water, which can also go through aquaporins and stuff. But simple diffusion is what we call it when these molecules can kind of just go through the membrane itself. But you're not going to be able to take ions through the membrane that way. You're not going to be able to take bigger things, you're not going to be able to take bigger polar things. Those things are going to need help. And then again, we can have our passive transport where basically we just provide a way through so that they can travel along their gradient or we give them do a more active transport where we're actually having to use some energy either directly, um, which would be primary active transport or indirectly, which would be secondary active transport.